The title of the panel is New Zealand's Asian Story, and I don't, I don't think I need to, uh, to explain to this audience just how important uh, Asia has been to, uh, to New Zealand's foreign relations over the last uh, uh, three or four decades or so. But if there was any doubt, I think it was probably uh, removed during the last panel uh, when we heard so many references to the, the rise of Asia. I think Gary Hawke put it that the defining characteristics of New Zealand's diplomacy over the last 25 years was this shift to Asia. We heard about the dynamism of the Asian tigers, uh, the rise of regional architecture through institutions like uh, APEC and an ASEAN-centered uh, multilateralism, and of course, the rise of China. Uh, in New Zealand's views, Asia has gone from a region that was seen as somewhere that was poor and insecure and perhaps dangerous and to be kept at bay to a region where we, uh, to the most economically dynamic part of the world economy, somewhere that we want to be close to, somewhere that we, we even talk about ourselves as being part of the region. Uh, we've been hugely fortunate to enjoy uh, uh, what Claire Kelly called the golden weather of the last few decades. Um, but I think one of the questions that perhaps our panelists will touch on is whether or not the golden weather is, has come to an end, whether there are dark clouds on the horizon, and what that means for New Zealand's interests. So to help us understand where we've come from and where we're going, we have a very distinguished panel. To my immediate left, uh, left Professor Malcolm McKinnon, uh, historian from Victoria University of Wellington, I'm sure very well known to, to all of you. Next to him, Professor Rob Rebell, uh, Vice President of the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs. Uh, next to Rob is Professor Natasha Hamilton Hart from the Business School at the University of Auckland. And finally, at the end of the panel is uh, Ben King, Deputy Secretary for the America and Asia's Group at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So without any uh, more from me, I'd like to invite Malcolm to make his opening remarks. Tēnā koutou katoa, ki hoki whakamuri, ki ana whakamoa. Look back to look forward. In 1943, Asia was the Far East, at least the part of Asia closest to New Zealand was. That term, replicated in other European languages, captured the notion of an East beyond India. Seagoing, it was part of Asia you entered coming from Europe, through the Straits of Malacca, and into the China Seas, South China, then East China prophetically named, it might be thought, in 2018. For Americans who approached the region from across the Pacific, it was often the Orient, although also the Pacific, as in the Institute of Pacific Relations, which focused on Japan and China almost exclusively in its early years, a very different Pacific from New Zealand's Pacific, about which we learned this morning. In 1943, the year the ministry Department of External Affairs, as it was in, was established, the Far East equated with Japan's greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, almost exactly that bitterly contested wartime attempt at Asian cooperation. History, politics, and economics have determined that it is this Asia which has most preoccupied New Zealand and its politicians, officials, and diplomats in the 75 years since 1943. Their preoccupation was grounded in the geographical imperative, not the Far East, but near North, although not that near, really, but the arc of Asia within the New Zealand hemisphere, which is otherwise, of course, mostly ocean, ice, and desert. That's Australia, of course, the desert. A decade or so on from 1943 was an Asia shaped by three victories. The US victory over Japan, the Chinese Communist victory in the Chinese Civil War, and not quite a victory, but significant nonetheless, the triumph of anti-colonial nationalism in Southeast Asia. It was a divided region, a US-aligned part anchored on Japan and Australia, a communist part centered on mainland China, and a non-aligned part centered in the 1950s on Indonesia and India, two of the five countries which hosted the celebratory Bandung Conference of African-Asian nations in 1955. No prizes for guessing which of these three New Zealand's politicians, officials, and diplomats put the most effort into through the Cold War years, and Rob will talk more about this. The logic of the, alignments was of the alignment was compelling, though not uncontested at the time. Its finest moments were not the silence in the face of violence in Indonesia in 65, 66, 
acquiescence in the brutal annexation of East Timor in 1975, or endorsement of the credentials of the ousted genocidal Khmer Rouge regime at the United Nations in the early 1980s. But the logic, the pragmatism that Brooke identified in his opening remarks was compelling and consistent. That New Zealand-aligned Asia was the forerunner of Asia-Pacific, a term also reflective of the economic dynamism of Japan and its neighbours, which Gary alluded to early before lunch. Importantly, Japan had also become one of New Zealand's principal economic partners by the end of the 1980s. So for New Zealand, Asia-Pacific was a security and economic community. If Asia-Pacific has an official start date, which is not to discount a lengthy prologue, it would be November 1989, the month that APEC, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, first met, the penultimate month of the boom on Japan's stock market, and the month in which that bellwether organisation, the National Geographic Society, released an Asia-Pacific map. Its last similar treatment of the region being a 1952 map labelled the Far East. The Asia-Pacific map reached from Mongolia to Mururoa, from Siberia all the way to Stewart Island. The Asia-Pacific of 2018 is the direct descendant of, but not identical to, the Asia-Pacific of 1989. In the 1990s, the nascent community embraced the communist states of Eastern Asia. One pathway to this change lay through ASEAN, which we also heard about before lunch, which at its outset straddled the pro-American non-aligned divide and overcame that other divide when communist states joined the grouping in the late 1990s. A second pathway, of course, lay through China's willingness to join APEC, the, Asia, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and other regional initiatives all the way through to RCEP, and we've also heard about much of that in the preceding session. New Zealand diplomats have been avid supporters of these developments, which promised and delivered on a region of cooperation, not conflict. For New Zealand, as for ASEAN's own members, ASEAN centrality has been a crucial part of the regional architecture, affirmed at gathering after gathering and an initiative after initiative. It is an architecture designed to accommodate the large and regional players. So far, so good, although it's impossible not to be aware, of course, of challenges. The biggest change in the 21st century has been China's enhanced economic and strategic weight in the region. It's perhaps useful to remember that in 1990, when APEC got underway, Japan's economy was two to three times larger than China's. Even at the end of the 1990s, it was still significantly larger. But at the beginning of this decade, China's economy overtook Japan's. For New Zealand and for most regional states, China has replaced or rivals Japan as the most significant economic partner in the region. Absent India playing a significant role in regional affairs, Asia for New Zealand will continue to be Asia-Pacific, a focus of livelihood and security and a principal object of diplomacy. Certainly Indo-Pacific does not yet resonate here. But that diplomacy is now shaped by an awareness of an asymmetry of scale between China on the one hand and other regional states on the other. I will have a forego discussion on China in favour of those speaking later who know somewhat more about it than me. What does all this mean for New Zealand's Asia? Natasha will have more to say about that, but I'd like to conclude, we've tied, we're only eight minutes, not 10 like the people before lunch, <laughs> with offering some historically informed observations. The contemporary practice of New Zealand foreign policy has been shaped by the country's participation in accommodating structures, first the British Empire, then the US alliance system, with the United Nations a hopeful alternative to the later, latter never fully realised. The, the participation in both instances was buttressed by a sense on the part of most New Zealanders that they shared culture, interests and values including the value of vigorous political debate with their major allies. In comparison, New Zealand's participation in the Asia Pacific, whether we consider it in American, Japanese, ASEAN plus or Sinocentric iterations, has been a government and business matter and has remained so despite the immense and valuable efforts of Asian New Zealand Foundation and the recently established Centres of Asia Pacific Excellence. To borrow from anthropology, it's a thin rather than a thick engagement. 
This is most obvious in two ways. One is the absence of commonalities in popular culture or in sport, the contrast in respect of the latter with the subcontinent, or for that matter, the Pacific, is very telling, I think. The other is the absence of engagement with politics rather than with governments or businesses. Do these absences, does this thinness matter? And I guess I'm trespassing a little bit on Natasha's territory here, but I think we'll complement each other. I think it does. Commitment to a regional community as fundamental to New Zealand as is Asia Pacific benefits from buy-in from the population. Commonalities in popular culture, including sport, may flourish as New, Zealand, New Zealand's Asian population takes its place alongside Pakeha, Maori, and Pacifica in the formulation of New Zealand identity. Seeking commonalities through politics is much trickier, of course, particularly in respect of countries where political processes exist to legitimate governments rather than to challenge them. But they can be fostered by reaching out to individuals, enterprises, institutes, NGOs, and other groupings across the region which espouse a more challenging outlook, to use a diplomatic adjective. There are plenty of them. In other words, we can try to do more of what the foundation already does very well. New Zealand's Asia policy has actively supported and sustained regional collaboration for half a century, two thirds of the life of the ministry. That endeavor has been hugely successful both for New Zealand diplomacy and for the region. The ministry itself should take a bow and so should those individuals who have endured so many interminable meetings for the greater good perhaps an extra bow. To find ways of embedding the, this Asia-Pacific endeavor, the Asia-Pacific community more solidly in New Zealand life may not be an appropriate mandate for the ministry, but it is a fitting way of buttressing what has been achieved by it in this area of its work so vital to New Zealand's future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. I'd now like to invite Rob Bell to uh, provide us with a, a case study talking about New Zealand's experience uh, with the Vietnam War. Not quite Malcolm's height. Tenakota katoa and xin chao kui vi, as they say in, in Vietnam. As David mentioned, I've been asked to talk about a case study in New Zealand's Asian journey. And I'm going to be talking about one which was very significant for New Zealand in the 1960s and 1970s, but also represents one of the more troubled periods in New Zealand's engagement with Asia, and one which represented some of the many challenges that New Zealand has faced in its Asian challenge, uh, in its um, Asian journey, I should say. In retrospect, involvement in the Vietnam War in the 1960s and 1970s stands out as a turning point in New Zealand's engagement with Asia and in New Zealand's approach to alliance relations more generally. In broad terms, Vietnam coincided with a shift from containment of perceived threats from Asia to engagement with multifaceted opportunities in Asia. And our Vietnam experience was a watershed in, in that respect. I'd like to focus primarily on the consequences and the legacies of the Vietnam War, which of course remains New Zealand's most divisive war experience historically. And uh, I was very taken with Jim Bolger's comment about history being fixed, but the legacy still dominates. And there are numerous legacies for this country from involvement in the Vietnam War. Before doing so, however, I'd like to make a few observations about New Zealand's rather reluctant road, uh, road to involvement in the Vietnam conflict. In, in many respects, New Zealand's involvement in that conflict was part of a more general shift in New Zealand's positioning in the post-war years, something which, uh, which uh, Malcolm uh, depicted and spoke about in general terms a few, a few minutes ago. And from 1945 to the early 1960s, we saw a shift in New Zealand's general reliance on the United Kingdom as a security guarantor to a, more, uh, a reliance on the United States, particularly embodied in the ANZUS, in the ANZUS alliance. We saw New Zealand embedded along with many other nations in the Cold War. We saw the rise of perceptions of communism 
as a threat to New Zealand's security, particularly communism as it was, be, as it was unfolding in Southeast Asia. We saw this, in this period, increased cooperation and interaction with Australia as well, which had not necessarily been the case to any marked extent before the Canberra Pact, which was mentioned earlier, earlier today. We saw in New Zealand a growing interest in Asia, but primarily in terms of fears of a communist threat emanating from the North. And we also saw in this period New Zealand adopting a security policy based on forward defence in Southeast Asia, which involved New Zealand in various conflicts and in various military deployments in different parts of Southeast Asia. Now, that general context notwithstanding, when New Zealand was asked by the United States uh, with increasing intensity in the early 1960s to be one of more flags alongside the United States in the Vietnam conflict as it began to unfold and intensify in the early 1960s, New Zealand was rather reluctant to participate. Prime Minister Keith Holyoke uh, harboured various apprehensions uh, about being involved in that conflict. Uh, defence, uh, I should say, uh, officials in what is now the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade had even more deep-seated apprehensions and did not see optimistic prospects for success uh, through Western intervention in the conflict that was raging in Vietnam at the time. Ultimately, though, New Zealand's reservations, both political ones and both bureaucratic ones, were trumped by alliance considerations. And when a request, a firmer request, finally emanated from the United States in 1965, the decision was taken to commit combat forces, initially in the form of an artillery battery in, uh, in mid-1965. That was, that decision was based primarily on alliance considerations. In effect, that decision represented a choice between the classic exit, voice, or loyalty. New Zealand could have said no. Both our officials and our prime minister feared that that would, it would cause damage to the alliance with the United States and with Australia as well. New Zealand could have expressed its doubts. It did that, and our far-sighted officials did make some efforts to do that behind the scenes. Unfortunately, Australia's enthusiasm for involvement tended to overshadow what New Zealand said behind the scenes. And ultimately, New Zealand decided that it was more significant to join the United States despite the prospects for success in Vietnam looking rather, rather gloomy. Um, so loyalty, ultimately, was the decision. Now, Brooke mentioned this morning that uh, the character of those who have served in the Ministry of Foreign Affair Affairs and Trade over the years has been marked by principle and pragmatism and phleg phlegmatic professionalism. And there is no doubt that in that key decision of 1965, that professionalism was on display. Officials played a key role in persuading a reluctant Prime Minister that New Zealand needed to be involved because of the significance of the alliance. As um, Alistair McIntosh put, put it, if we do not support the United States on this occasion, when we need the United States, they may wash their hands of us. So it was a decision in which officials played a key role and did so not based on deep knowledge of Vietnam, not based on local nuances or in response to the situation on the ground, but rather on an independent, dispassionate, professional assessment of New Zealand's larger interests in the alliance context, for better or worse, with Australian enthusiasm about involvement being a mediating factor in, uh, in that decision as well. It was probably the last significant decision made by a New Zealand government on, based on a more than century long tradition of relying on a security guarantor against shifting external threats. Now the Vietnam experience played a key role in modifying that approach. And in terms of our actual participation in Vietnam up to 1972, 
Those factors which I've mentioned to date continued to prevail. It was characterised by prominence given to alliance considerations, a good dose of financial frugality. Uh, Brooke was not the first chief executive to pay attention to uh, how far the tax uh, taxpayer dollar goes, and we had a very frugal prime minister at that time as well. Uh, that prime minister also tried to limit the political fallout from that decision. And there was a good deal of political pragmatism on display on the part of Keith, Keith Holyoke, who tried to minimise the extent of our involvement to the, mere, uh, to the, uh, the, the minimum credible uh, amount that we could commit forces to satisfy our allies. There was, though, also an element of principle in all of this, and that is anti-communism was a very strong force, both in political circles and in the wider public in the 1960s, something that would change over time. As a result of those, of those factors, New Zealand's involvement in the Vietnam Wars was very ably characterised by Ralph Mullins, an official at the time in the ministry, who described our stance as the most dovish of the hawks. And that very much characterised how New Zealand approached the Vietnam War. And in many respects, that approach of being the most dovish of the hawks could be described as a successful and distinctive strategy, diplomatically, politically, and economically. It certainly preserved harmonious alliance relations. However, of course, over the course of involvement in the Vietnam War, there was a bitter and divisive debate that developed in New Zealand concerning New Zealand foreign and security pro uh, policies more broadly uh, going beyond the Vietnam War. The, some of the consequences of that were that a government had to defend a military intervention on an unprecedented scale. Officials were involved in that public defence to an extent that had never occurred before in New Zealand. What's more, one of our two major political parties, Labour, developed a different approach and a different policy towards the conflict from the uh, ruling national, part, uh, national government. And Labour argued that it was possible to dis disagree with your key ally on a specific issue and still have a strong and robust alliance. What's more, to the left of Labour, they developed a widespread anti-war movement, with, which developed a more general critique of New Zealand foreign policy, which was nationalistic in character and argued for a more independent foreign policy as well. That anti-war movement lost pretty much every battle that it fought during the course of the war, but some might say that it won the, the wider war of public opinion in the long run at least. I did an official history on this subject. I wrote an official history on this topic, which was launched by Helen Clark in 2005. And uh, during the course of doing the research for that book, I never found one document that showed that the government was moved by anything that the anti-war movement did. However, in the longer run, the anti-war movement and the stance taken by Labour had long-run effects on New Zealand's relationship with Asia, its relationship with the United States, and its positioning in the world more generally. Let me conclude with a few consequences of the Vietnam War. Uh, bipartisanship in policy has been, in foreign policy be, has been mentioned on a number of occasions this morning. The Vietnam War brought a fracturing of a previous bipartisan Cold War consensus on foreign policy. It could be argued that it also brought a greater democratisation of foreign policy and a need for politicians and officials to heed the views of civil society on key foreign policy issues. It also initiated a shift in threat perceptions. The notions of a yellow peril and a red peril began to evaporate over the course of the Vietnam conflict. And it was during this period that our attitudes towards Asia began to shift from that instinctive stance of containment to a sense of the possibilities of engagement. The US alliance itself was intact at the end of the conflict, but it was, it was strained as a result of the, those critiques and of the shift in Labour's position as well. In a sense, the day of reckoning was delayed. Uh, I, would, I would add that I think that we should also note that the Vietnam conflict in some ways laid the foundations for the later anti-nuclear dispute with the United States on two levels. 
One was the argument made by Labour, first during the Vietnam War, that New Zealand could disagree with its key security guarantor on a specific issue and still have a wide-ranging, robust alliance. That would be more vigorously tested in the 1980s, and we know the outcome of that test. But I think more broadly, also, the longer-term effect of the critique, that nationalist critique that was mobilised by the anti-war movement, suggesting that New Zealand needed to have a truly independent foreign, foreign policy, uh, what, what Malcolm McKinnon has described as a foreign policy of opposition and, and dissent. In terms of viewing New Zealand's Asian journey, Vietnam set in train the transition from that perspective through which we approached Asia primarily as a security problem, viewing Asia through a security lens tinted by Cold War apprehensions of communism and requiring, requiring above all, the protection of a powerful security guarantor. Instead, I think the ultimate impact of our involvement in the Vietnam War and in terms of our Asian journey is that it led to the recognition that New Zealand needed above all to apply its own eyes, its own ears, and its own voices directly if it was going to be a constructive player in the Asia Pacific in its own right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for such a, a deep and detailed consideration of the, of the Vietnam case study and for looking at some of those longer ongoing consequences for New Zealand foreign policy. I'd now like to invite Professor Nat Natasha Hamilton Hart, who's going to make some remarks looking forward. Thank you, um, and I should say thank you to the organizers who invited me here. Um, I feel slightly abashed at addressing a room with so many towering figures of New Zealand diplomacy in front of me. It reminds me of the first time I entered through MFAT's doors as a very new public servant in 1991 when MFAT still lived on the terrace. It's always a bit of a jolt to me to realize that it doesn't have its old home on the terrace. My remarks are not specifically focused about New Zealand's diplomatic relationship with Asia, but I thought I would mention that this is a very timely recognition of MFAT's organizational existence. And it's a good thing to have the organizational capacity to have a strong and coherent diplomacy in the region as well as the rest of the world. And that if you don't nurture that organizational capacity through things such as remembering significant birthdays, uh, you may no longer have it. So I am glad to wish MFAT happy birthday. Uh, I was asked to talk about New Zealand's future relationship with Asia. And I always tell my students, don't write about the future. Uh, if I were to make some very speculative guesses about where we're heading, I would say that our, our relationship with Asia in the future is going to be shaped very broadly by things that happen inside New Zealand, things that happen inside the different countries of Asia, and also what happens at the global level. So let me run through in a very speculative and selective way, some of those potential changes. First, if I talk about New Zealand uh, and what has changed and what is likely to change, the first thing that I think of is the demographic shift that has happened in the last 30 years. Um, in many ways, our population has already substantially changed. It has become far more Asian. I came back to New Zealand seven years ago from 10 years teaching in Singapore, and on my first lecture, I looked out and I thought, my class looks exactly the same. <laughs> but they have Kiwi accents. So the increasing population of New Zealanders with Asian heritage, I think, is an enormous asset for this country. And the question for New Zealand, I think the challenge for New Zealand will be how to integrate that incredible human resource 
Uh, and if you've been watching the news in the last two days, I say, we have to have better models of integrating New Zealand's diversity than the ones that I've just been hearing about. The other changes, of course, in New Zealand include our economic change. Are we going to become a more innovative country that, allow, that creates more value at home? Or are we going to stick largely with the same model of dairy out tourists and students in? I saw today's news said that we have slipped further on the World Economic Forum's ranking of glo global competitiveness, largely because of our reduced ranking in innovative capacity, which doesn't look very promising. Political change, who can tell? I'm hopeful that we will avoid the sort of populist nationalist wave that other countries have seen. What will happen in terms of our educating for Asia and our ability to be a nation that connects in a much more broad-based way with Asia? Uh, Malcolm McKinnon's remark said it's a very thin relationship. I'm not so sure. I don't think it's so thin. But I think that we have a challenge to educate for Asia in a way that is not entirely transactional, so that we don't simply see Asia as a marketplace, uh, somewhere to go and make money, but as somewhere where we can actually form partnerships. It's somewhat depressing to note that uh, my former colleague, the late Professor Nich Nicholas Tarling at the New Zealand Asia Institute, in the 1990s, he produced a book called Imparting Asia at Auckland, and it was a decent-sized, quite, you know, thick book. If I were to do the same about what the University of Auckland offers in the way of Asian education now, it would be a very short document. So in this space of educating for Asia and to try and broaden our relationship with Asia, I have to call out the, the great work that is done by the Asia New Zealand Foundation because it is one of the few agencies that really focuses on educating in a very broad way and building people-to-people -people ties rather than just trying to do more business. I want to show a picture of some of the breadth that I think doesn't grab the headlines. Uh, the top picture there is of a seminar that we hosted in the New Zealand Asia Institute. It's a leading Korean film producer who came in to address an audience. It was actually a packed audience uh, of people interested in, in Korean cinema and um, who also included many New Zealand filmmakers of Asian heritage who were very well informed about the Korean cinema scheme, scene and had lots of enthusiasm for Korean movies, uh, Korean games. I've also included a list of the top, um, top selling video games. And, and you know, I don't know about defining New Zealand culture, but I'm afraid at the moment, uh, computer gaming is a big part of New Zealand culture. It's not all rugby. Four out of the 10 top selling computer games in New Zealand are made by companies from Asian, in, in Asia, in, in East Asia, Japan and Korea. I will also show a picture of what I would hope to be the future. This is a group of our Asia Savvy students. They meet um, at the University of Auckland. Uh, these are young New Zealanders, uh, predominantly e ethnic Asian New Zealanders, but not exclusively so, who have come to spend a day together talking about the future of the relationship with the region. And I hope that these people are going to go out into the workforce in many, many areas and build that relationship. And I hope that in 20 years' time, when the New Zealand Herald lists its nominees for Business Leader of the Year, the pictures should look different, in my view. I hope. If I were to very quickly switch to what might happen in Asia over the next 30 years, uh, on the economic front, um, lots of uncertainty, of course, but I think one thing for sure is we're going to see a growth moderation. The high growth rates that Asia was famous for cannot be sustained. There will be some kind of rebalancing towards increased domestic consumption. There will be increasing aging, increasingly aging populations. And this should also tilt the balance towards consumption. The political trends in the region are far too complex to go into as a broad generalization. But of course, Asia's politics are different. They're different within each country, and they're very different from New Zealand's in many respects. Um, I would say the 
in our terms, we would say a lot of the region is illiberal. And I wanted to show a picture with the leaders of ASEAN as they were last November at the top. This is ASEAN centrality. Below you have the East Asia Summit people to add in a few others. And if you actually take a moment to look at the faces of each of those leaders and consider what kind of politics they represent. We have Duterte from the Philippines. We have, we had Najib, the now disgraced former prime minister of Malaysia. We have countries, most of whom are either not democracies or are what I would call illiberal democracies. They have different understandings about the role of individual liberty and civil and political rights. And when you add in some of the people who hang around the edges and are also very important, uh, we don't see liberal standard bearers for human rights and democracy, although we do see one bright spot. And he has every reason to smile, I guess. Mahathir was the reason I became interested in studying Asia. If I were to mention, finally, obviously the global s situation will be very important in determining what pathway our, our future engagement with Asia takes. The previous panel already talked about the threats to the WTO, so I'm only going to briefly show you this guy. <laughs> but I will say that what happens in, new, in the regional architecture, the institutions that have the potential to unite Asian countries, and possibly that might include New Zealand, but there are divisions within the competing acronyms that the region is blessed with or cursed with. Um, and New Zealand really needs to figure out where it sits, I think, because I think whatever happens at the global level, the foundations that are laid at the regional level now are going to determine whether this, and with apologies to the New Zealand Herald, whose cartoonist I have, I'm using, is this going to be our future or can we be something else? Thank you. Thank you very much, Natasha. And now our final speaker on the panel. Uh, please welcome Ben King. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa. It's great to see uh, so many former ministers and managers and colleagues here today. Um, I was talking to someone a little bit older than me over lunch with uh, Carolyn Schroger, and we were remarking how great it is to see our former bosses here. He, he remarked he was doing the same. So it's quite a, um, a prestigious lineup of generations. So the panel today has offered us uh, three thoughtful perspectives on New Zealand's Asian story. Malcolm McKinnon's reflections on the evolution of New Zealand's relationships with Asia the shifting focus of New Zealand interests and the evolution of regional nomenclature over the years has been very useful and it's a point I will come back to later in my remarks. Rob Rebell's input convincingly argued the case uh, to view the Vietnam War as a turning point in New Zealand's engagement with Asia and our approach to alliance relationships more broadly and I think also made the case for the Vietnam War as a significant driver in the development of New Zealand's approach to our foreign policy through an independent lens and one where New Zealand interests were uh, the prism through which uh, events were viewed. Natasha Hamilton Hart's contribution shone light on some very important questions that face New Zealand and our region, including demographic changes and political trends. These things matter. I must also say I agree completely with uh, Natasha Hamilton's uh, Hart's argument that New Zealand cannot sit on the fence. We need to have a clear sense of our interests and our, the rules, architecture and relationships that will advance our interests. And as a foreign ministry, we need to work tirelessly to pursue those ends in our region and multilaterally. As we look ahead, Malcolm McKinnon's reflections on the past are very instructive. In 1943, he pointed out that nomenclature for the region was set from Europe, hence the references to Asia as the Far East. In a discussion I was involved with with Professor Robert Ason earlier this year, he made an important observation that policy drives nomenclature. And we can see that borne out in the way that our own descriptors of Asia have developed. Malcolm McKinnon talking about the near north 
and then the development of the term Asia-Pacific. It was also useful for Malcolm to point out the way that even that term, the Asia-Pacific, has evolved from what we understood it to encompass at the birth of the APEC process in 1989, and what we understand it to mean now. Which leads me to reflect on one of the issues currently being vigorously discussed in the region, the growing number of countries which now describe the region as the Indo-Pacific, as referred by Malcolm McKinnon also. As is often the case, the term Indo-Pacific means different things to different actors. At the most simple level, we can think of the Indo-Pacific as a geographic descriptor. That is the product of a conscious decision to shift the boundaries of how we talk about this region and who is included amongst those we consider to have interests and influence here. And in that context, while talking about an Indo-Pacific that may not resonate here yet, it does have some logic. India is an active participant in ASEAN processes, most notably through its membership of the East Asia Summit. And we know that the geostrategic competition that we see playing out in Southeast Asia has strong echoes in some parts of the Indian Ocean. However, the Indo-Pacific also has a strategic edge. For example, Japan has promulgated a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, a so-called FOIPS. President Trump also talked about a FOIPS on his visit to the region in November last year. And at the Shangri-La Dialogue this year, India's Prime Minister Modi also defined the Indo-Pacific as standing for, and I quote, a free, open, inclusive region which embraces us all in a common pursuit of progress and prosperity. It includes all nations in this geography as also others beyond who have a stake in it." End quote. For New Zealand, the evolution of the regional rules-based order and the development of new architecture presents both risks and opportunities. And in the context of Natasha Hamilton Hart's challenge for New Zealand to be clear on where it stands, I can say that we have a clear set of principles through which we assess new initiatives such as the Free and Open Indo-Pacific, the Belt and Road Initiative, and the Asian Investments Infrastructure Investment Bank. These principles, openness and inclusivity, transparency, freedom of navigation and overflight, adherence to international law, including the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, respect for sovereignty, open markets, and ASEAN centrality must, from a New Zealand perspective, sit at the heart of initiatives we support. And in that context, although New Zealand does not border the Indian Ocean in the way that Australia does, and while the term may not resonate here yet, the reality is that we do have interests in the Indo-Pacific. We understand and we're quite comfortable with the concept of an Indo-Pacific and how New Zealand interests are positioned within that. In conclusion, I will just say that New Zealand's present and our future is inextricably linked to the future stability and prosperity of the Pacific, Asia and the broader Asia Pacific and what others define as the Indo-Pacific region. This is where our interests are most acute and that's why generations of officers of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, supported by successive governments, have invested so significantly in this region. It's a pleasure to have been able to reflect on the inputs of such a distinguished panel. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions and comments from the floor. We have about 10 minutes. So can I uh, please uh, invite you, if you would like to pose a question or make a brief comment, uh, to uh, please put up your hand. Uh, yeah, Simon Draper, please up the back. Uh, thank you very much, Simon Draper from the Asia New Zealand Foundation, and thank you very much, Natasha, for your kind words. And, and let me just acknowledge the founders of the foundation in the room, um, Sir Don McKinnon and Philip Burden. Um, my, my question is, is, you know, we know during the Security Council campaign that New Zealand's stronger support wasn't from Europe, New Zealand's stronger support wasn't from the Pacific, it was from Asia. So there was something about Asia that interests us, and you've talked on the panel about us looking out and what we value in Asia, in terms of the trade and commonality and, and bits and pieces like that. Can I ask the panel, what do you think interests Asia 
about New Zealand, and, and I realise, you know, Asia is a very big country, but, you know, <laughs> within those very different perspectives, what is it you think, from their sp- perspective, as they look at New Zealand, what is it they value? Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Maybe if, we, if there are other questions, maybe we'll take two or three and then go back to the panel to, to uh, take them. Are there any other questions? Yeah, please. Thank you. Since the last uh, presidential election in the United States, uh, more and more, I think, New Zealanders are thinking we can't trust that country anymore. They don't deserve, perhaps, to be our principal guarantor of, our, of liberty and all good things. Uh, does the panel think there's anything in that? Are we seeing a long-term shift in our perception of who we should throw our lot in with, on who we can afford to depend upon, uh, and if they don't, why not? <laughs> Thank you very much. If they don't, why not? Uh, anyway, perhaps we could take one more question if there's a, a, a query from the floor. Thank you, over there. Um, I would like to uh, get some more insights about uh, the Indo-Pacific concept from the uh, MFAT's pers- perspective. Instead of uh, maybe echoing about uh, the policy from other governments, are we going to see the concept being embedded uh, in the foreign ministries, for example, strate- strategic plan in the future? Moving forward, thank you. Could you just, was that the first part of the question was just a little unclear? The Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific, okay, thank you. Okay, well, let's, um, let's put that to our panelists and uh, Malcolm. How is your Caesar? Is, that hmm? is that the one you're doing? How is your Caesar? Yeah. yeah. I'll defer the third one to, um, to Ben. To ben. Um, how is your Caesar? Um, there's always a risk that these occasions will to generate from analysis into anecdote or anecdotage, uh, but I guess we all have our sense of it. One of the things that struck me about being in Asia is that Asians, while we talk about being a part of the region, most Asians have a sense that we're very remote from the region. And so part of the dynamic is, is in a way playing on that remoteness rather than trying to pretend it doesn't exist in their minds and that whole notion of New Zealand as a a relatively benign part of the larger regional landscape, I think, is, is part of the story. I'll, I'll leave that one there. On the um, second question, I'll just briefly state that I don't think we should give up on the United States yet. Um, I think the question on how do the people in different Asian countries see us is a very important one. Uh, I know the foundation in the past has done some research, survey research that's specifically on this question. My own experience from, from, from living there for more than a decade is, is you know, there's this sort of general goodwill, positive, but quite sort of stereotypical picture of New Zealand as a, as a sort of clean place where your, your children will grow up without any stress and I, I don't mention the suicide rate and the drug use. And, um, but I think the, the bigger question is, is, as well as asking how does Asia view us, one of the things we should be investing more in as a country is on how, do different, how, how does the world look if you are sitting in Malaysia or in Japan or in Indonesia? And how does the world in general look from that perspective? Uh, I got interested in Southeast Asia at a time when the buzz was APEC and Wellington was waking up to the idea that there was this great economic opportunity out there in Asia. Uh, Of course, at the time, the rival to APEC was Mahathir's East Asia Economic Community, or East Asian Economic Caucus, as it became. Uh, And back then in Wellington, there was no appetite, as I could see, to even try and understand what Mahathir's vision consisted of. Why was he doing this? He was dismissed as variously racist, arrogant, stupid. And of course, he was none of those things in any serious way. Um, he was 
and still is a person with enormous vision for his country. One could take issue on many points of it, but the, the need to understand where the different countries are coming from, I think, is really important. We're, we're always going to run up against sort of bafflement if we go to the Indonesians and, for instance, say, you know, you really should liberalize your agricultural trade because it would be so much more efficient, uh, because that really clashes with their vision for a self-sufficient food economy. Um, and I think we do need to invest more in, in understanding their perspective, both in general and in relation to New Zealand. Um, I have no answer to the question of, can we find some country to replace the United States? Uh, except probably not, but you had something to say on that. I, I do. Over to you. Just an answer to, to Jim, Jim's question. I agree with Malcolm that we certainly shouldn't give up on the, on the United States and that the key role that it's played both in the region and globally, uh, and there are certainly divisions of view within the United States about, uh, about its current approach to, to world affairs. But I think more importantly, what we've seen since both the end of the Vietnam War and since uh, the UK joining the EEC as it was then, is that we've seen this country has diversified its relations with the rest of the world in many, many different ways, economically and politically, and in terms of the kinds of nations we talk with and, and deal with. And I think that when you ask the question of who should we throw our lot in, I think we need to continue to maintain that diversification, and it's particularly important in our region that we uh, have the kinds of relations with a range of countries, I think particularly in the ASEAN region, uh, a range of countries who who are not the greatest powers in the world and who have common interests with us in, this, in maintaining rules-based multilateral approaches to the region. And we need a lot of nimble diplomacy and very strong relationship building across the region to be able to do that. And uh, I think it's very good that MFAT, I think, understands that very, very well. Um, excuse me, Ben. Thanks. Um, I think the question about um, how Asia views New Zealand has been uh, adequately covered. I would just add my lot to uh, uh, saying a shout out to the Asia New Zealand Foundation. I must say when I was uh, ambassador in uh, Bangkok, I found the work of the foundation to be a huge value add to the work of an embassy. Uh, the Asia New Zealand Foundation does a lot of things that governments can't do. Uh, and they do them very well. So uh, to Simon and to the founders, um, hats off. It's a great organisation. Um, on the question about uh, uh, Mr Sutton's question um, about whether we need to be looking for replacement friends, um, I think I would uh, just fall in with uh, Rob Rebell's uh, comments there and we, are, you know, we need to and we do look at uh, our approach to the world through a New Zealand interest lens. And what we are very sure about <coughs> is that New Zealand uh, does best and relies heavily upon a rules-based order and that we look for partners uh, who share those interests and we look to partner with them. And that is a shifting um, group of people on various issues. And we call out uh, uh, partners who fray at the edges of the rules-based order, be that on climate change or be it on maritime security, uh, and with others through a range of, including through ASEAN uh, and through Europe uh, and through the uh, Americas, we look for partners who will work with us to support uh, all of those things based on the principles I ran through, transparency, openness, open markets, respect for sovereignty, international law, ASEAN centrality. Those are the things that are important to us as we go about uh, our business and we look for partners. Uh, and many times that's the United States and many times uh, on other issues it can be China. So um, that concept we should or will be forced to choose, uh, we uh, reject at this point. Um, on the Indo-Pacific, it was a um, good question. If you look carefully in the strategic framework, you'll see there is at least one reference to the term Indo-Pacific uh, for the, the Ministry's new strategic framework. And I think uh, the point I was trying to make in my uh, remarks is that um, we understand and are very comfortable with the Asia-Pacific, uh, but we also understand and are comfortable with a different set of descriptors being the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it's, um, it's just a different way and a different description and a different set of principles. Thanks. 
Uh, I'm afraid that brings us to the end of the time that's allotted for this. I think we could go on talking for an awful lot longer about these issues, but I think we've been treated to uh, four presentations this afternoon that have, uh, have looked back and have framed their remarks, uh, speakers who framed their remarks in the history of where New Zealand's come from, but have also offered some really interesting insights in, in uh, the principles uh, that are going to shape New Zealand's relations in the region in, in, the, uh, in the years ahead. So please join with me in thanking our four speakers. Thank you.